Uh, okay, so I'm happy to introduce uh, Mark McConnell from Princeton University talking today about uh, computing hack operators for cohomology of arithmetic groups. Okay, well, yeah, thank you so much. I really, uh, I'm really so happy to have this invitation, especially in these days of COVID. It's, uh, but yeah, why can't we keep virtual seminars going along? So um, I'll be talking about, I guess, basically three different projects by the time I get going. Um, and they're all joint work. The first is joint work with Avner Ash, Paul Gunnels, and Don Yusaki. Uh, the second was joint work with Bob McPherson. And the third with um, Dylan Gold, an um, undergraduate from Princeton, just recently graduated, who I uh, just introduced. So um, I'll just start with some definitions and general setup, although for all of this stuff, there'll be a, I'll be going into more depth with the examples as I go along. So the basic definitions are um, let boldface G be a connected semi-simple algebraic group, say defined over Q, and ordinary G is its group of real points. K, let that be a maximal compact subgroup. And uh, I'll be considering the Riemannian symmetric space G mod K. Then uh, inside of G, there's an arithmetic subgroup gamma, and then uh, gamma mod X, at least if gamma is torsion free, we call it gamma mod X a locally symmetric space. So um, the main example for today is uh, G is SLNR, and K would then be the um, SONR, the maximal compact. And uh, yeah, at least for n greater than or equal to three, all the arithmetic groups of the conjugacy are going to be congruent subgroups of SLNZ. So let gamma be a congruent subgroup. Um, probably everyone's familiar with like the simple example. If G is SL2R, then X is um, isomorphic to the upper half plane. So that's the space where modular forms live. I'll have the classic picture up later. Here's another example. Um, and I won't be talking much about this in the talk, but I, I know it's familiar to many of you, so I, I want to have it in the air. Let um, boldface G be the restriction of scalars of GLN um, over some number field little k, and let OK be the ring of integers. So now um, here we're in a setting where you look at the places of the number field k, and for SLN, you, you'd get a copy of the um, Riemannian symmetric space either for SLNR or for SLNC, and uh, you get a product of those places. <clears throat> Things are a bit more complicated because since I said GL, the uh, units of OK are going to come in there in an interesting way and sort of mix the factors together. But uh, at any rate, this is familiar to some of you as um, if K, little k, is a real quadratic field, this is the uh, setting for Hilbert modular forms. Uh, if K is imaginary quadratic, this is the setting for the Bianchi groups. Um, and uh, something else I'm going to be talking about today is uh, G is the symplectic group, SP2NR. It, um, you fix a, a, a non-degenerate alternating form on, on a real vector space. Um, it's a theorem that that has to be of even dimension 2N. Then, um, then inside of SP2NR, you have the subgroup SP2NZ, and we can take congruent subgroups of that. Then X, which would be G mod K, is known as a Ziegel upper half space. So SP2 is SL2. So uh, the Ziegel upper half spaces are generalizations of the upper half plane. Um, and like the upper half plane, it has a complex structure, unlike the ones for SLNR, which, which uh, just don't have a complex structure. So for instance, X mod gamma would be a Ziegel modular variety. So SP4 are the first case above SL2, you'd get Ziegel modular threefolds from this. Just as another example uh, people may be familiar with, uh, G mod K mod SP2NZ, in other words, the, um, the congruent subgroup of full level. That's the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension little n. So these are um, these are classic examples of Shimura varieties as well. So um, the basic outline of the talk is I'll be talking about some cases where we've done computations for SLN and then end with some new work for SP4. By the way, anytime uh, people want to ask questions, just unmute yourself and um, and uh, and ask. 
Right. So um, all the uh, both as G's I've talked about in this, uh, we'll be talking about in this talk have X contractible and the groups gamma act properly discontinuously on X. So, well, at least if X is, excuse me, if gamma is torsion free, then I can say that X mod gamma is a K pi one. And then the uh, group cohomology of gamma, say with coefficients in C is equal to the cohomology of X mod gamma with coefficients in C. I guess. If, uh, you, yes. if you take uh, C coefficients, you don't even need torsion free, right? Because uh, right, yeah, right. Built yeah. by C anyway. Yeah, the, the yeah, the torsion free modifies um, the statement about k pi one. If if you're torsion free, then you got a k pi one. And in either case, you've got the, the statement over C. Um, so I also want to um, look at not just the constant coefficient systems, but non, you know, general coefficient systems. Um, so let M be a, um, I'm gonna say rational finite dimensional representation of G over a field F. F could be say the complex numbers or it could be a finite field of, uh, you know, the, for today the field of P elements, of course it could be uh, any finite field. I was to use P elements today. So um, such an M gives a representation of gamma Hence, it gives a local system on X mod gamma. And then we can state that the cohomology of gamma with coefficients in the representation M is the cohomology of X mod gamma the space with coefficients in the local system. Um, when we go to do HEC operators later, I'm also going to want to make sure that not just that M is a rational representation, but I want to make sure that the Z structure on M is compatible with everything so that you know, gamma, which is, you know, arithmetic will be acting, but I'll always assume that in this talk. Um, then in this last statement one, if gamma has torsion, the statement is still true as long as the characteristic of F doesn't divide the order of any torsion element of gamma. So much of what I'm doing today is for SL4, where in SL4Z, the torsion elements are of order uh, divisible by either two, three, or five. And uh, so two, three, and five are sort of the bad or at least interesting primes today. So um, th this statement, I'm not always going to avoid the primes two, three, and five today, but um, I'll talk more about that case later on. There'll be an appendix in the slides which deals with two, three, and five. Okay, but mostly I'll be looking at primes away from two, three, and five or in characteristic zero. All right, so um, of course, the cohomology of gamma can be uh, studied from the point of view of automorphic forms. So uh, I believe it's Franke who has the theorem that this cohomology can always be understood in terms of automorphic forms, specifically automorphic forms of cohomological type. So those are the ones with the non-vanishing GK cohomology. And then, um, as I understand, it's a theorem of Franke and Schwermer, that follows from work of Franke and Schwermer, that the cohomology of gamma with coefficients in any representation M breaks up as a direct sum. Okay, the main part of this direct sum is the cuspidal cohomology, which would be cohomology coming from cuspidal automorphic forms. Then the other parts of the cohomology can be understood by um, stuff coming from the boundary components. So, I'll often be talking today about the borel serre compactification or other compactifications of X mod gamma. And so the, um, the boundary components will be um, indexed by classes of associated proper Q parabolic subgroups of G. And for those using the theory of Eisenstein cohomology, I can understand the cohomology at infinity in terms of things basically from the uh, smaller dimensional parabolic. So the cusp forms themselves have paramount interest and the others sort of inductively, we can at least hope to understand by the parabolics. So this, this formula uh, two is sort of, um, like symbolizes what we're gonna do today. So in very rough outline for the rest of the talk that are the kind of computations I'm gonna be talking about in the talk, uh, we uh, tend to commute the terms into explicitly um, I know many of you at 
Purdue are studying the stable cohomology. So that's SLN or other groups for large N, and you let N go to infinity in various families of gammas. Um, what I'm talking about today is sort of the, uh, the opposite. The, it's SLN for little n fixed. In fact, mostly for me, little n is two, three, or four. And then we're going to let gamma vary through various levels, not in families, but sort of the gammas are all different, and we want to see what happens. So in our computations, we'll compute these terms explicitly as much as we can. The main thing in the talk is learning how to compute the heck operators on all these pieces, which um, that gives the arithmetic structure on the different pieces um, as one thing. It, it's the best way we have for recognizing which part of the cohomology comes in which piece. We are, the theory of the Eisenstein cohomology at the boundary, in terms of practical computations, that needs to be worked out more. Now, I haven't, yeah, I don't have that under control, say, in my own computer programs. But we, um, because we can compute the HECA operators and to decompose thing into HECA eigenspaces, that's how we understand these decompositions in our, in our computations. Mark, may I ask a question? Sure, yeah. Um, so, could you say what this decomposition means in terms of the cohomology of X mod gamma for those who, um, like me, don't know about automorphic forms? Well, let's see. The, um, maybe an example is from classical modular forms. So, in, in classical modular forms, X mod gamma is a Riemann surface. So think of something of genus G, probably gamma is of a high level than that. You think of a Riemann surface G with a large number G of donut holes. So, yeah. Surface of genus G is a surface with donut holes, one dimensional complex manifold. But also there are going to be um, punctures in the Riemann surface corresponding to places where X mod gamma needs to be compactified. So, um, mm -hmm. It, using the classical theory of modular forms, you can compactify, it's a Riemann surface with uh, cusps going off to infinity, one, one or more different cusps. And each cusp is compactified, in that case, by sticking one point onto the Riemann surface. The cusp is like a, like a trumpet going off to infinity in the hyperbolic metric, and you stick one point on at the end. That You do have to change the, comp the structure of the complex charts of the Riemann surface to do that. Then um, every time you glue on a point like that, you understand the cohomology in terms of an Eisenstein series, in terms of a modular form that's an Eisenstein series. And for SL2, at least, they have been worked out uh, very thoroughly classically. So you get in um, H1, which is the interesting degree there, you get one contribution of H1 from each cusp point you glue onto the Riemann surface. That's again understood in terms of an Eisenstein series. We're talking about way two here. Um, once you've glued all those cusp points on, there's a lot of cohomology left. In fact, all the cohomology that came from the genus G. So if you've got a compact surface of genus G that has real cohomology in H1 of 2G dimensions, and that's understood by the um, holomorphic cusp forms, modular forms of way two. And then also the anti-holomorphic cusp forms give you the, uh, the, the second group of real dimensions. And um, so what you see here in formula two is the generalization of that from the group SL2 to it, higher SLNs or SPNs or indeed all the, uh, all the both these Gs. So there's a theory of cuspidal automorphic forms which generalize the modular forms cusp form. Basically, the cuspidal automorphic forms, the story there is they're, they're automorphic forms, but they die very quickly as you approach infinity. So it's cohomology su truly supported sort of on the interior. Then the other things are understood in terms of boundary cones. The boundary components, when you glue them on, they're going to be coming from at least uh, symmetric spaces of lower dimension. Like if you compactify sl 4 symmetric space, you're gluing on things that are coming from SL3 symmetric spaces, or gluing on things that come from SL2 cross SL2 symmetric spaces, or refinements of those sm smaller corners, you get SL2 single symmetric spaces. 
Okay, well, maybe I'm. Uh, Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, hope, hope that story helps. Um, any other questions? Oh, wait, so I'm talking uh, arithmetically. All these cohomology groups, at least conjecturally, and not looking at them from the point of view of the Langlands program, they all have attached Galois representations. They conjecturally, the automorphic forms have L function. The, the L functions have these magic factors in them at each different P, and those factors control Galois representation. I probably in this talk, just for the sake of time, Galois representations are something I won't talk much about today, although I do have appendices at the end of my slides to talk more about them. A final remark is we, in our computations, we look at both torsion classes and non-torsion classes in this cohomology, uh, sort of different papers, different, yeah, some are non-torsion, some are torsion. Well, let's see, why don't I um, move to like the my biggest family of examples, which is the case of um, SLN. And here the story is, these spaces X are going to be spaces of lattices. So let me tell you what that means. So again, in this example, family of examples, G is SLNR. So SLNR, SLNR is matrices of determinant one, but I'm going to think of that as matrices given by rows of determinant one. Really, a matrix with rows is a basis of Rn where the row vectors are the basis. So it's G is a space of bases of Rn of determinant one. Now, when you let these gammas act on the left side, so SLNZ acting on the left side on rows, SLNZ acting on the left side of rows forms Z linear combinations of the rows. So you're adding and subtracting integer multiples. So that takes basis vectors and starts adding them together into lattice vectors because it's Z linear combinations. When you act by SLNZ in all ways, all possible ways, you get all possible bases of a given lattice and you might as well take their union and just call that the lattice. In other words, G mod SLNZ is the space of all lattices in Rn. If you go to a congruent subgroup gamma, G mod gamma is a space of lattices with extra structure. Like a, if gamma is a congruent subgroup, the principal congruent subgroup say gamma of N, that's, um, that means you um, you choose a um, homomorphism from the lattice mod capital N to uh, Z mod N Z like to the appropriate power. It's it's basically you you color your lattice points with a lot of different colors in a way that's equivariant mod capital N. You can ask uh, ask your kids to do that and put it on the refrigerator. I've done that sideways glance at my daughter. Um, let's see. So that was space of lattices with extra structure. This maximal compact subgroup K comes in, that rotates the ambient space. Actually, the choice of K comes down to an inner product on, choosing an inner product on lattices, a notion of length. So G mod K, the symmetric space I've talked about, is a space of lattice bases modular rotations. So finally, the locally symmetric space X mod gamma is a space of lattices with the mod capital N extra structure and modular rotations. So as I explain the following uh, the constructions that come next, I'm going to explain them in terms of uh, lattices. So first of all, how to compute cohomology in this setting? Well, um, for, for lattice L, the arithmetic minimum of a lattice is uh, basically what's the shortest vector, okay, not counting zero the arithmetic minimum that is the length of the shortest vector. But if the lattice has a lot of symmetry, then you might have vectors tied for being the shortest vector. So um, the minimal vectors of L are all X whose length equals that minimal length. Notice that uh, if X has minimal length and negative X has the same length, so that's a, at least plus or minus pairs tied for minimal length, but uh, for really symmetric lattices, you have more. Now, um, a definition is that a lattice is well-rounded if it's got enough symmetry that it's got enough minimal vectors to span Rn. And uh, I'll let W sitting in X be the space of all bases of well-rounded lattices. So now I'm going to state a few theorems on the next slide or two, and then, and then after that explain it geometrically. 
So the, here's the theorem of Abner Ash and this uh, in various papers in the late 70s. So there is a, this is how you use it to compute cohomology of X or X mod gamma. It comes down to the fact that there's an SLNZ equivariant deformation retraction from X down to this W, the space of well-rounded lattices. So therefore we call this W the well-rounded retract. Um, I know virtual cohomological, excuse me, virtual cohomological dimension is familiar to many of you. It's um, basically in X there's, for SLN there's N minus one dimensions that go off to infinity and need to get compactified. Well, for some purposes, we don't want those there to get compactified. We want to retract those extra dimensions away. And this W is where you're doing that. So um, the dimension of W is the dimension of X minus the quantity N minus one. That turns out to be N choose two. So that's called, this number is called the virtual cohological dimension. It's abbreviated VCD. So, so W has just the right dimension for cohomological computations. And, and even better for, for us who like to do concrete computations, W is a locally finite regular cell complex. So the cells are char characterized by coordinates in Z to the N of their minimal vectors um, with respect to the basis, you know, W is a space of bases. I'll give you examples of that in a few slides. Um, Voronoi in 1908 decomposed X, the symmetric space for SLN, into polyhedral cones in an SLNZ equivariant way and got a finite reduction theory from that. The, um, the cones are defined by what are known as perfect forms. It turns out W is dual to Voronoi's decomposition. I can't go into this today, but I'll have to allude to the perfect forms later. And then finally, we've got a, a finiteness property mod SLNZ or mod finiteness subgroups of it, namely, W mod gamma is a finite cell complex. So not only is W a locally finite and SLNZ equivariant, when you mod out by SLNZ or, or finite index subgroups, you've got only finitely many cells downstairs. So you can really compute with it. Um, let me just make a note that as Ash wrote several papers on this, and uh, perhaps the final one on this topic, uh, he did it for all number of fields, little k, not just for q. So the conclusion is that in the settings above, the cohomology of gamma with coefficients in any um, M can be computed in finite terms. And uh, so I've, I've worked a lot on this myself on the computational side, you know, in terms of <laughs> big computers, little computers, big matrices, long runs. Um, I would love to give a talk on just the computational side, but you know that if I got going on that, that'd be at least a half hour out of an hour talk. So I'll just, um, it's an appendix one, you'll have the slides some after this in case that's of interest. So for now, I'll move on to uh, examples. So let's again do SL2 in the upper half plane. Um, so let them equals two. Here's a classic picture of the upper half plane. The, uh, the shaded region in the two colors of shading is the fundamental domain for SL2Z. So SL2Z acts on this upper half plane by linear fractional transformations and the shaded region is a fundamental domain. The W we're talking about is this graph or in Sarah's book, it's a tree. Um, you know, these arches that I'm now moving my mouse over and the vertical lines and then further down more arches. Um, it's a tree that at every vertex is trivalent, the three edges coming out. Uh, in fact, the vertices of W are the bases of the hexagonal lattice. And, you know, the hexagonal lattice is what you get if you pack pennies together as closely as possible on the tabletop. Um, that's of the lattice of Z adjoin the uh, cyclotomic uh, field Z of three. The uh, edge centers of these edges are in fact bases of the square lattice, Z adjoin I. <laughs> and the, um, the classic square lattice is right here at the center of the shading. The well-rounded retract is, in this picture, is if you're above the tree, slide straight down, excuse me. No. Sliding straight down along vertical lines is what is known as the geodesic flow in the theory of the borel serra compactification. So sliding down along vertical lines lands you plop on top of the tree everywhere. What about down here? Now I'm position, okay, I'm gonna position my mouse and hold it steady over zero. In the upper half plane model, 
geodesics, geodesics, like I said, for at infinity comes straight down, but geodesics coming at coming through zero are they look to our eyes like circles, Euclidean circles that um, come out of zero, you go up initially at 180 degrees, make an ordinary semicircle and come back down somewhere. So those circular arcs coming out of here at 90 degrees, long radii, short radii, doesn't matter. Those are also geodesics. And they, um, I'm gonna trace one out with my eyes. It comes up and bumps into an arc of the tree over here. Okay, so, so I claim sliding up these geodesic arcs, whether above or below, that's the well-rounded retraction in this case. Um, I should stop and um, describe what the well-rounded retraction is for SLN for all n. I used to have a, a live demo of this computer generated, but you know, the software changed out from under me and I couldn't get a new copy. Um, so, so let me explain the well-rounded retraction in, in general. So take any lattice of rank n sitting in Rn with, and take the standard notion of distance. Um, you look at the lattice, somewhere there's a shortest vector. Um, without less of, or let's assume the lattice is generic, so there's only one shortest vector together with its negative. Call that vector V1. What I'm gonna do is consider the real line through V1, fix that line and find the ortho complement of that line, which is of dimension n minus one. And I'm gonna do a scaling where in the n minus one orthogonal dimensions, I'm gonna shrink in by a constant factor, like zoom in by the same constant factor in all dimensions, while not shrinking in along the line through V1. The line through V1 must remain fixed. But so you shrink in it, you see how my hands are like, a, it's like I'm grabbing a Campbell soup can and I start to crush the Campbell soup can uniformly on all the round sides. As you do that, there's gonna come a moment where a second linearly independent vector is gonna come in and tie for being the shortest with the original first one. The moment it, you have a tie for short vector, you stop. They're spanning at least a two dimensional plane. Now do another step, fix the two dimensional plane through those two vectors can find the ortho complement in the remaining n minus two dimensions, shrink in, in those n minus two dimensions by a zoom in while fixing the first two. If you had three independent vectors happening to tie for short vector, that's fine, just like fix the first three and shrink in the other n minus three. So uh, that's the well-rounded retraction, very, very um, nice to describe and make movies of, and, um, and it collapses the whole thing down to this tree. Of course, in for n equals two, there's only one step to do. For SL3, there's in general two steps to do. Here you're retracting from five dimensions down to three. And I've claimed you get a cell complex. The cell co complex turns out to be this cell here called the Soule cube, um, all glued together. And uh, the whole complex has one copy or has multiple copies of the Soleil clue glued together, just as the tree before had only one kind of arc and multiple, multiple instances of that arc glued together. So the Soleil cube, it gets glued together. You have to check this, but um, notice it has triangular faces and hexagonal faces. It, the Soleil cube turns out to be a take an ordinary cube, chop off four of the eight corners and you chop them off, um, you know, two opposite ones on the top and the ones opposite to those on the bottom. Wherever you have a triangular face, four of those Soule cubes are glued together along that triangle, just as in the tree in the last slide, three edges come into a vertex. Of course, you, you can't glue three solid objects along a triangle in three space, you have to go to five space or four space. <laughs> along every hexagonal face, three Soule cubes come glued together. Um, and the vertices, all the vertices turn out to be the same in, in this picture. Some look more like 90 degrees and some look more obtuse, but that's an illusion of the picture. They, um, they're all copies of the A3 or the D3 lattice. That's the last of closest packing of your oranges at your, at your supermarket, you know, the three-dimensional closest packing. Um, it's called the Soule cube, by the way, because um, Soule's thesis, Christophe Soule, was um, was on computations for the cohomology of SL3Z and related groups. He, he didn't exactly use this retraction, but he 
use something, a similar retraction and, and got the results. Sulean, Sulean Lan, I think, actually published this shape. Okay, um, any, any questions? Okay, so um, those are examples. Um, uh, just like to take a moment to notice that um, Abner and I proved in 1996 that the well-rounded retraction actually extends to the compactification, specifically the borel serre compactification. The, um, but it, the retraction, as I first defined it, was just on the open part, uncompactified, but you, um, you know, for applications to compactification, you want to be able to go out to the points in infinity. You have to do things a little carefully because out of infinity, it, the retraction I defined isn't, isn't well defined, but you do something else first and then you retract in. The, the gist of the theorem is that even coming from the browser serre compactification, the retraction is a composition of geodesic flows away from the boundary components. And for SLN, it's basically those N. But basically, the moves I described where you fix one real subspace and contract in like Campbell's soup can on the other dimensions, that's the geodesic flow in the world of the Borel serre. So you're just doing N minus one different kinds of geodesic flow. And this is a statement for all um, SLN over number of fields K and related groups. All right, let's see. Um, but now this is a talk on how to compute HECA correspondences, HECA operators. So let me describe those. I'm going to describe HECA correspondences in two different ways. One is the, the world of lattices, so more concrete and geometric. And the second is the way you see it in the literature and the, and the way we'll generalize it. So the more colloquial way is, um, OK, let script L be a prime throughout the talk. Um, let k be uh, any integer between 1 and n. Um, I'm, I'm describing these right now for SLN, Z, and its subgroups. I'll just, in the exposition here, I'll let gamma be of uh, level 1, like let gamma equal SLN, Z. So as we've said, x mod gamma is the space of lattices, mod rotations, and homothetes. Um, I haven't brought up homothetes before. You know, SLN, Z is, is determinant 1, so those lattices were constrained to have determinant 1. But for what I'm about to do, it's you really want to give yourself the freedom to multiply by a, a positive real scalar in all dimensions. That doesn't change anything about the shape; just changes the changes the determinant. That, that's called a homothety. So I give myself that freedom. So space of lattices, mod rotations, and homotheties. Okay. Now um, to define the Hecke operator correspondence, given any lattice L, there's only finitely many sublattices M inside L with L mod M being isomorphic to a given group. And here I, I want the group Z mod LZ to the kth power, so elementary abelian of order L. L group K. So there's only finitely many M that satisfy this. So definition, the Hecke correspondence TLK is the one-to-many map on the space of lattices to itself, given by sending L to all these Ms, a one-to-many map. Um, so. Uh, here I've just shown a um, picture for SL2 that I prepared. I taught a junior seminar on this a couple years ago. Um, so looking at the first row of this picture, you see the HECA correspondence for T of 2 for SL2. Because um, th there's one lattice here that's always the same. You know, all these pictures have the same underlying lattice. It's you know, given by both the darker and the lighter dots. It's roughly square up to what the aspect ratio of tech can do. But the top row shows that there's three ways to put an index two sublattice inside the given lattice. One way is take every other row. The way on the far right is take every other column. And the way in the middle of the top row is take the checkerboard lattice. And those are the only three possibilities. So a T2 is map any given lattice to these three sublattices of your given lattice. T3 is fix the lattice L, and there's four ways to take a sublattice of index three. Yeah. Every third row, every third column, or two different ways to sort of take a checkerboard, either left, roughly speaking, slope one third or slope two thirds. Uh, then um, HECA operators can be multiplied, and in fact, 
you know, com by composition and you get a commutative algebra this way. And this picture illustrates that when you um, illustrate any of the three index two sublattices on the top with any of the four index three sublattices on the left, you get one of 12 index six sublattices as shown in the body of the table. And so T6 is a heck operator that's a one to 12 map. Okay, so that's so, like that's the informal way. Um, here's the more formal way that we'll generalize. Um, consider the diagonal matrix matrix that's um, one 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 followed by L L L L L. That's the prime L with k copies of L and minus k copies of the number one. Let um, you know gamma naught of n comma k. You know. Look at this little matrix here of, of shapes star star zero star. Um, that's familiar with the definition of gamma naught. I'm going to take gamma naught of capital N K, where the bottom right star is K by K, the upper left star is square N minus K by N minus K. And we're taking matrices congruent modulo N to this shape. So, so the, in the zero place, it's all stuff congruent to zero mod N. Now at um, I can take X mod my gamma intersect this gamma naught of LK. And it turns out there's two maps down here. So heck operators are about two maps. <laughs> the first is, you know, gamma has this gamma intersect gamma naught as a, you know, the thing on the left is a subgroup. So certainly I can map a subgroup times G to gamma times G. Here, um, G is anything in SL2R, you know, you know, X is capital G mod capital K. So G is an element of capital G viewed mod K. Um, I can, this thing on the map, uh, thing on the left here is certainly well-defined because it's just going from one coset to a coset that contains it. But uh, if you chase through the definitions, another thing I can do is take this coset on the left side and map it to gamma TG for this T up here, one, 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 LLL. And the heck correspondence, the official definition is start downstairs, map through the inverse image by R, and then push back down by S. So one point downstairs will map under its inverse image for R to many different points. Of course, in general, there's formulas for the number things of L and N. But then when I push back down by S in general, all those points upstairs will go to different places. So you get a one to many map. Okay, well that was the HECA correspondence. The HECA operator is what we call it when it's operating on homology or cohomology. So officially the HECA operator on say cohomology is, um, I reverse this and take the adjoint. It's you do the S upper star first and the R lower star second. So you're um, in cohomology, you know, upper star pullback is the natural operation. Then our lower star in cohomology is not defined in general, but it is defined when there's finitely many uh, sheets to your covering in general. It's not a covering, it's covering with singularities. But if there's finitely many sheets in general, then our lower star is defined on cohomology, better known as a transfer map. And yeah, the transfer map is always the hardest part to get right in writing your papers. It's also the hardest part to get right in your programming. And I sweated several years over that. I think I can say it's right now and has been stable for a year or two. At any rate, as um, alluded to, these HECA operators for all L and all K, they generate a commutative algebra as indicated in the previous slide for T6. And that's called the HECA, the HECA algebra on your cohomology. Uh, can you okay so now here's you question say, uh so this automatically inside of the endomorphism algebra of uh, the cohomology or is uh, is like you you kind of define this um internally i guess in inside of the en endomorphism algebra or is there like an external definition in that way so it's like the free algebra over all of these operators or are there relations coming from the cohomology. Right, there's there's definitely going to be um, relations coming from the cohomology, right? I, in, in this talk, I'm not defining the external free version. I'm just 
I'm, I'm defining the correspondences and then the heck operators are whatever they do in the image on the cohomology. Okay. 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 So um, this slide is going to be, um, in a sense, the most important slide in the talk <laughs> because the difficulty in computing heck operators is that they do not preserve these well rounded retracts W. So let me um, illustrate that with this picture here. I'm going to have to move my mouse slowly so you can see what I'm doing. Um, the, this is the upper half plane picture, not the correspondence picture, but say the HECA operators for T2 for SL2, as I've indicated before, there are sum of three different terms. And if you chase through the linear definitions by linear fractional transformation, they're the linear tra fractional transformations um, well, 2001 becomes 2z, so you send z to 2z. Another one is z to a half z, and another is a half times z plus one. So let's talk about z goes to 2z. That's a linear fractional transformation. The origin is down here where my mouse is. z goes to 2z, well, stretches everything in this picture by a factor of two radially out from the origin. So see this arc here that I'm tracing out the main arc in the center? Apply 2z, and now you've got to slide twice as far out along the radius from the origin. Notice that my mouse is now, it's not on the tree anymore, and it's hovering sort of halfway above one of the arcs of the tree. As I move along the arc, 2 times z goes, oh, wrong, wrong picture. 2 times z goes back and forth over this halfway point and then across over this other halfway point. So I've got a new arc, it's not in my tree. As I said, the, uh, the well-rounded traction will push it straight down, but now I've got an arc that's the right-hand half of this arc plus the whole of that arc plus the right-hand, or excuse me, the left-hand half of this arc. You can see my mouse. So basically the heck operator has forced me to take my arcs and break them into fractional arcs. And while you said that may not be so bad, you know, half an arc is still pretty nice. Uh, it had a nice point at the center from coming from the eye. But, uh, you know, in general for T17, the heck operator, you're going to have 17th of this and that. It becomes a big mess. So, um, okay, so in the rest of the talk is, in fact, how we deal with that problem in various ways. So first, I, um, I know Many people at Purdue have worked with the Sharbley, so let me go through that, because that's where we've done most of our computations. So I'll um, go through this sort of briefly. The, um, the, in the Sharbley complex for SLN, I consider uh, n by n plus k matrices with entries in Q. So uh, think of n rows and either n or more columns. And uh, the k Sharbleys are formal Z linear combinations of symbols A in brackets. So you consider all these matrices, putting them in brackets is called a symbol called the Sharpleys. The symbols obey uh, certain rules. That I consider the basically free of the and group on the symbols, except that I have to say that um, permuting columns of A multiplies the symbol by the sign of the permutation plus minus. Multiplying a column of A by a non-zero scalar doesn't change the symbol. These symbols are sort of cones geometrically, it doesn't matter if you uh, change the length of the cone generating vectors. And then finally, if they're also sensitive to rank, if the rank of A is less than N, then the whole thing is deemed to be zero. You give, um, so this is a, you know, it's a complex. I put a boundary operator on the complex in the usual way by a, the boundary of a symbol is delete the columns in turn and add them up with a plus or minus all the many sum. And then this is called the Shardley complex. So it, it was uh, named by uh, Avner Ash and his friend Lee Rudolph uh, because it was, came from a paper by Lee and Sharba. So what's an element of a Lee and Sharba complex? So it's got to be a Shardley. Okay. So um, the relation of this to um, SLN is there's the Tietz building I'm just going to be dealing with the Tietz building for Q today. I know, yeah, many of you have worked with uh, other fields on this. The Tietz building is a, over Q is the simplicial complex whose vertices are proper non-zero subspaces of Q to the N. 
you make them into simple size simplices by considering flags in q to the n. The thing is homotopic by the solomon teach theorem to a bouquet of spheres, Sn minus 2. And the Steinberg module is the uh, reduced homology of that bouquet of spheres in the only dimension of the geometric. Now, by borel sur duality, going back and forth between the ith cohomology and the homology in degree BCD minus i, and at least if gamma is torsion free, the Steinberg module is the dualizing module. So that, that gives how you go back and forth between those two degrees. Now, um, the Steinberg homology is the Steinberg module tensored with my coefficient of module m, and you take a um, homology of gamma in that. So then um, Lee and Scheib proved, working with Q, that the Scheibly complex is a resolution of the Steinberg module as an exact sequence of GLN Q modules. And if gamma is torsion free, then the Scheibly complex is a gamma free resolution of the Steinberg module of Q. So on with this, we, um, we say that the Scheibly homology of gamma is the homology of the Scheibly complex tensor with M since then. It's a resolution in a setting. So in this setting, at least you should get Steinberg homology from the Scheibly homology. So we've got a lot of cohomologies and homologies floating around here. The thing to say is if gamma is torsion free, they're all the same. So the group cohomology, the cohomology of a locally symmetric space with whatever coefficient module, cohomology of the borel sayer with whatever coefficient module, cohomology of the well-rounded retract, the Steinberg cohomology, and the Scheibly homology. They're also the same if M is over a field of characteristic P where P doesn't divide any of those torsion elements in your gamma, which say for SL4 is away from 2, 3, and 5. At 2, or at 3 and 5, and especially 2, I'll refer to Appendix 2, which is one slide later. Okay. But now how do we turn this into computing heck operators? So the, um, the cells of the well-rounded retract are characterized by their minimal vectors which are a certain number of vectors in z to the n, n or more vectors. So th think of the Scheibly complex as this huge infinite thing, like you, you have arbitrary matrices that are n by n plus k for arbitrary k. Yeah, not negative. Whereas think of w as this sort of nice finite object. Mod gamma, there's only finitely many cells. So up to S, L, and Z, there's only going to be finitely many n plus k tuples that matter so for our computations. So up to S, L, and Z, this finite set of symbols maps into all the Scheibly symbols. So we get a well-rounded or a Voronoi Scheibly subcomplex of the Scheibly complex. Now, that's, this only works in the range of dimension of the cells of W, because you know, this is only finitely many cells they're going to run out after a while. N, in th N equals 2 and 3 are small enough that it always works there. And for N equals 4, it works at least in the range that contains the range of cuspidal cohomology, like cohomology H6 and H5, which is our primary interest. Um, now, HECA correspondences act on the Scheibly complex. The Scheibly complex, as I've defined, is rational matrices and act by matrices of a determinant power of L. We still got rational matrices. But they do not carry W to W. So in our computations, say the ones I worked on for SL4, we compute Scheibly homology, formally not the, uh, not the well-rounded homology. So now, um, but I can explain it a bit more how we do it in practice. Um, our, um, um, Mark? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, can you, I don't know how much, uh, in how much detail you want to go, um, uh, but maybe you can come to a conclusion of your talk in the next five minutes. Well, right, I know, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Here's what I show. I want to talk about some of the um, newer stuff. So, and I think the uh, the Shively stuff is well known to people at Purdue. So, and we can maybe talk about that over lunch. So, why don't I skip to some of the um, newer stuff, and I want to get to the symplectic stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, um, change of topic. So, 
the methods with Sharblies that we use, because of the sh well rounded complex and the Sharbly complex, when you get into um, degrees far enough from the VCD, you know, basically W runs out. So that method doesn't compute the cohomology in all degrees I. Um, but so many people have thought about how to compute hack operators in all degrees I. And um, Bob McPherson and I, we th were thinking about this back in 94, 95, the project got put on a back burner for a while and uh, we got resurrected in the mid 2010s. So in, by 2016, I think we, uh, we had a theorem and still needs to be written up, but I've been putting my effort first into programming it and it, as a program, it's working fine. So let me tell you a bit about this. Um, this works in principle for any um, one of these Gs that's the restriction of scalars of GLN over a number field K. In practice, we have working code for just SLN Z, you know, and it's do it over Q. For SL2 and SL3, I'm sure it'll work for SL4, but the software engineering is pretty big here. So um, in this exposition, I'll just restrict myself to N equals two or three. So, um, this is going to involve changing the well-rounded retract to something called the well-tempered retract. So here's how this goes. This is not about a lattice L, but a pair of lattices L and M. So um, we, we, uh, we're looking at the heck operator for Z mod L, Z to the K. Fix one of the sub-lattices M of L so that the quotient is Z mod L to the K. We, the essence of this method is to introduce a real parameter t that goes from l on up it, it can stop at l it starts at one and goes up to l it's called the temperament when t equals one our well-tempered complex is going to be the same as the well-rounded retract but t is a continuous parameter and you slide it up to l so you get a complex that's one dimension higher than the well-rounded retract and here's the definition. A vector y in L has tempered length t times y if y isn't in the sublattice m, or length y if y is in the sublattice m. So um, why would you do this? You see, let, let's imagine right now that t is big. Let's imagine t is very big, and you try to do this well-rounded detraction. Well-rounded detraction was all about gradually shrink the last and look who ties for shortest vectors. Well, if vectors that aren't in a certain sublattice M are being multiplied by a huge constant, if, we, if we're decreeing that their length is artificially huge, then they'll never tie for shortest just because we say they don't tie, we say they're big. <laughs> so if T is large, we're defining here a retraction onto making the sublattice well-rounded. On the other hand, if t is one, this is the well-rounded detraction. So as t continuously varies, we're continuously interpolating between a well-rounded retraction for SLN and a well-rounded retraction that is adapted to the heck operator, that, that only well-rounded retracts down to the lattices that matter for the heck operator. So, okay, one, um, let me unshare for a moment and show a video. Right, I have to, um, Oh, well, I did the wrong thing. I want to reshare my screen. Now you can see my screen again, but I'm going to bring up a movie. So this movie is going to start with the tree we saw for SL2 in a, uh, in say, Sarah's model, in, but in a disk model. And the tree is going to be going through a continuous family of deformations. As when I click on this, the deformations will probably be starting. Yeah, see the tree moving? There's gonna, look at the moment where it became an X there. Yeah, it was a trivalent free, I'll, I'll play that one more time. It needs to stop. Okay, start over. How do I start over? I forget how you start this thing over. Okay, I'll start another one for N equals three. You're gonna see that N equals three, the tree is moving and where I put my mouse, you're going to see the trivalent vertex coming in and for one moment it's going to become a six valent vertex there and now it stretches out and becomes three trivalent vertices but sort of in a backwards orientation 
Okay, go back to the slides. Yeah, I know I've got to I've got to stop here. Um, let me let me let me stop. So, um, the, the basic idea is the first picture in that movie computes cohomology. As I let the movie play, I compute cohomology of each piece. There's only finitely many times the movie changes. And uh, you, it's basically a quasi isomorphism, a series of maps on cohomology that are forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, alternating to go between different cell complexes in this, in this family. There's only finitely many that really are different from each other. Um, and this, the, our theorem is that if you set it up right, the whole thing can be computed by linear programming. And I do that in practice. And um, okay. The, um, the, last, the last thing to say is, in S, okay, just, uh, just, give me a, uh, just give me a few minutes here to talk about this slide in the next. Maybe you can skip to the theorem. Okay, so I'll skip. Um, the main idea is that for SL and the, the space all had a nice family of linear coordinates, I could do the retractions through an ambient linear space. And that's not going to be true for SP4 because they are SP4 lives in a space with a complex structure. You can't like retract in one dimensional continuous ways because you destroy the complex structure. But uh, in 1993, Bob McPherson and I nevertheless built a retract for at least for SP4. And uh, the new theorem uh, that Dylan Gold and I have been working on and finally got finished last time is you take an appropriate subcomplex of the Okay, here's the thing, an appropriate subcomplex of the SL4 well-tempered retract and let, it's an appropriate subcomplex for SL4, but that computes the cohomology for SP4. And you, you have to, here's the thing, take an, take an acyclic cell complex that computes the cohomology for SL4Z, how, and SP4Z is a subcomplex of that, how could an appropriate subcomplex not compute the cohomology for SP4Z? Well, the answer is they have infinite index, so you have to prove it computes something. But um, I was able to change the definition and we proved that it did. So basically, we, we now have a HECA algorithm for SP4 that's going to piggyback off of SL4. I, I do need to acknowledge many of you are friends with um, Paul Gunnels. Gunnels and Matthew Dutour Securek, who's famous for the um, work on perfect forms of V8 among the team. Those guys had a heck algorithm for SP4 previously. Michael Lipnowski and Oral Page a few years ago announced an algorithm for a wide range of, um, of G for heck algorithms, for heck operators for those. I think, um, so there's, many of us are working on heck operators for SP4 and indeed for all the um, non-SL groups. I think the conclusion about SP4 is all these heck operator algorithms are probably correct but they all need a lot of software engineering to be done. And I'm working on mine. I know Paul and Matthew are working in theirs, Michael's working in his. And well, so that's a place to stop. So um, uh, thank you for letting me go over. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your talk. Um, we can, I, I'll clap now for, for appreciation <laughs> and whoever. Can. Thank you. Um, are there, Questions for Mark. Let's see. Um, I have a question. Um, maybe maybe it's easier to talk about this later. But uh, I mean, uh, I think it would be very interesting to see the definition of. Um, <clears throat> of uh, the cuspidal cohomology and how you, how how it work like how you can distinguish in which of the summons the uh, cohomology at inf uh, in infinity um, falls. Is there is there something similar t for uh, for the symplectic? Is everything cuspidal automatically, or is is does this have to do with the um, uh, with a Hodge decomposition um, in that case? Right, that's, um, 
let's yeah let's see so first of all I'll go back to this slide yeah this this slide with the f the formula which um so this formula was for all the algebraic groups g so this this is like um not just s l or s p but for for all of them so there's a so there's always a um you know non in in my setting a non compact symmetric space with uh, arithmetic groups acting on it you you have the directions that go out to infinity and that you retract away when you want to go down to the VCD, but at the moment, let's not retract away. You go out to infinity along those directions. Those directions are controlled by a, a copy of the, um, the maximal torus of the Lie algebra. Going out in those directions gets you boundary components. So you always have boundary components, which are indexed by parabolics. And those boundary components always have their own copy of the symmetric space sitting out there. And indeed, in fact, bundles over the symmetric space coming from the, the bundle fiber is the unipotent groups. So there's always cohomology at infinity coming from those. So Harder and Schwarmer have worked on relating the Eisenstein series in the world of automorphic forms to the Eisenstein cohomology. So they, they prove that this stuff at infinity can be understood in terms of the Eisenstein series in the automorphic world. But in which that stuff will always be out there. So there'll always be cuspidal stuff coming from the interior and there'll also be stuff out there. And by the way, if I make it sound like it's always either interior or cuspidal, this is, um, this is something one should not do because there's, um, I'm pointing to each P here as if it's one component of the boundary, but the boundary is really competent. The boundary is these pieces glued together along the Tietz building. So, that, you know, say for SL3, you know, the Tietz building is a graph. And so at each node of that graph, you've got these parabolic pieces glued together. But you know, that, that Tietz building is, uh, it's like, <laughs> it's a bouquet of infinitely many S1. So you've got this very complicated gluing. Um, there are questions of ghost classes, which means, ghost classes mean, could you have cohomology classes which live on the sum of the boundary, but vanish on each individual piece and there there are examples of that okay yeah so i'm you can see peter if i could uh you you mentioned a definition of the cuspidal part i don't know if i'll be giving a definition but i could say more about that and about what i do with heca or what we do with heca to tell which part of this on the right is which i have a couple more slides about that at the end yeah, maybe we can talk about. So, can you quickly can say that uh, does does the heck action is that does that decompose into these uh, direct summons as well, or is uh, so does something cuspidal go, automatically go to something cuspidal under the heck action? Yeah, so um, something cuspidal automatically automatically goes to something cuspidal because the um, right there are powerful theorems. Um, General, generalizing the Ramanujan conjectures for our modular forms about how uh, the Hecke eigenvalues grow at a certain rate for cusp forms compared to how they grow for Eisenstein cohomology, and they grow for the cusp forms slower. So, like, uh, so in other words, you can tell the difference between these two parts. Yeah. For SL2, sure. it's still only two parts, and you can tell so the difference. So, different keys can go to each other, or like, Piece of Say that again? all the keys have to like the all the parabolics have uh, I I mean they have they are different but they also have different sizes or different I guess different partitions yeah. of n um, do um, uh, can different keys uh, be mapped to uh, to each other using the hacker transport uh, hacker action? Let's see so. I think the answer to that's going to be sometimes because um, sometimes yes, but sometimes no, because um, say say for SL four, one of the P's is the um, is a is a three by one parabolic. The SL three block in the upper left and SL one in the lower right. Another parabolic is the one by three, so those two can be sort of interchanged by duality, and the the Hecke eigenvalues are going to be the same there. 
but another parabolic is SL2 cross SL2 and on the two diagonal blocks. And so there, the SL2 heck eigenvalues are going to grow differently from SL3 eigenvalues, which are in turn going to grow differently from SL4 eigenvalues. And so you can tell the SL2 cross SL2 apart from the SL3 and from the SL4. Okay. Great. Are there other questions for Mark? I have other questions, but if, if you have time to stick around, maybe they're longer questions and we yeah, can yeah, have get into that then. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If other people have short questions, they should ask now. Yeah. Zach, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. Um, you had like a slide where you had like a bunch of like cohomology groups, like were like the same, like, you know, like each star of like, you know, W and like X and gamma and stuff like that. And I, I guess my question was, was, is the heck action like compatible with the isomorphisms? I assume not, but um, yeah, that one. Well, yeah, it, it the heck action is going to be compatible, with, and that's how we um, how we compute the heck actions, right? So all these things, well, as I pass from the first four of them into the sort of Steinberg and Sharpe world, that that definitely has to be proved. <laughs> well, it always has to be proved, but especially when you pass. Yeah, basically the first four are all different ways of saying saying the same thing with lattices. There, you know. So I, I indicated how uh, you have, if you have a lattice L and you look at its various sublattices, that's the HECA out definition of HECA operators in a rough and ready way. And in the first four cases, that's all pretty much the same. And then to pass to Sharpley homology, we map the well-rounded vectors of the lattice into the Sharpleys, and then you have to prove that it's still compatible. But it, but it is. Are there any more questions? <clears throat> uh, if not, let's thank uh, Mark again. <laughs> it's. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so.